Welcome to the Dance NYC 2022 Symposium, Life Cycles, Livelihoods, Legacies. We will be with you shortly. Today's schedule. Today we gathered for a welcome and wake up, morning sessions, an 11.30 dance break presented by Kumbe Center for African and Diaspora Dance, and 12 p.m. early afternoon sessions. We will now begin our 2.30 late afternoon sessions, followed by a 4.15 community daily debrief, where all attendees are encouraged to attend and discuss the day's activities. Finally, at 6 o'clock, we will present our last keynote presentation. Accessibility. ASL interpretation and live captioning will be provided for today's session. A stream to text link will be posted in the chat and participation guide for access to the live transcription. Stay connected with us by posting your takeaways on social media using the hashtags DanceSimp, DanceNYC 2022, and DanceSimp 2022. On Instagram at dance.nyc, on Twitter at dance.nyc, and on Facebook at dance slash nyc. Community Guidelines Based on Dance NYC's values of justice, equity, and inclusion, we agree to share our opinions, challenge perspectives, and engage or debate respectfully, and acknowledge and course correct if harm is caused. Honor everyone's personhood and humanity. Not tolerate speech that is disparaging, abusive, violent, or that is intended to defame someone's character publicly. Some features not to miss. Build your agenda of sessions. Connect with other attendees. Join community conversations. Visit the exhibitor hall. Don't forget to check out the 2022 Symposium Digital Program Book. We are happy to be in community with you. Thanks for joining. Welcome everyone. I'm Brooke Rucker. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a member of Dance NYC's Junior Committee. I am a non-disabled, cisgender, Black American woman. I am wearing a Black turtleneck. I have locks that are loosely curled. They start Black at the roots and they transition into medium brown at the end. I'm wearing dangly earrings that have turquoise stones at the end of them. In my background, I have a light gray wall. To my right, there are five hats that are hanging. Two of the hats are black, two are yellow, and the other one is a blue and gold bucket hat. To my left, there is a TV mounted on the wall, and I'm calling in today from the unceded land of the Muncie, Lenape, and Canarsie tribes that is also known as the Brooklyn neighborhood of bed -Stuy. First, thank you for joining us for the completely digital 2022 symposium held on the Whova platform. As we are at the mercy of technology, we want to remind you that there may be delays, sound issues, and changing circumstances that may occur during our time together. We invite you to extend us and each other grace and patience. Second, ASL interpreters Emilio Garcia and Alyssa Banner from Sign Nexus and closed captioning services provided by Nancy Rivera from the Viscardi Center will be available throughout the session. A stream to text link will also be available and posted in the chat for further reference. We will also post speaker information in the description below and under the speakers module on the left side of your Whova web app or the menu of your Whova mobile app. Please note, 
that this session will not be available for playback after this live experience. Third, feel free to post comments you wanna share with the community in the chat section to the right of this event room. Dance NYC moderators will be interacting with you there. For this session, the panelists have decided to not hold a Q&A to ensure presence of mind and ease in the conversation. However, please feel free to post your comments and reflections in the chat for the community's benefit. Feel free to call our helpline at 212-966-4454, voice only, for technical support or to propose comments if the chat is not accessible. After the session ends, there will be a session follow-up in the community section of Whova where you can continue the conversation. Lastly, we hope you will help us to amplify these conversations. Repost, tag us, and share your takeaways on Twitter at DanceNYC, Instagram at dance.nyc, and Facebook, dance slash NYC, using the hashtag, hashtag dance sim. And now we enter preparing for BIPOC executive directors, evolution through revolution. This conversation unpacks the generative question, how can organizations set up first time BIPOC executive directors for success? Anne Huang partners with Dance NYC to curate and moderate an anti-racist dialogue that addresses recruitment, hiring, onboarding, board transformation and development, and has applicability across the entire nonprofit field, which is so insidiously entrenched in white supremacy culture. Welcome to our full panel, Executive Director of World Arts West, Anne Huang, CEO and Executive Director of American Ballet Theater, Janet Rollet, Executive Director of Dance USA, Kelly Eduse, Executive Director of AIM by Kyle Abraham, Sydney Liggett Dennis, and Executive Artistic Director of Emerge 125, Tiffany Ree Fisher. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, 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 everybody attending the session and um, our powerful, powerful speakers today. My name is Anne Huang. I'm the Executive Director of War Arts West and Board Chair of Dance USA. War Arts West is a 44-year-old dance presenter and artist service organization that serves the largest world dance network in the U.S., over 450 dance companies. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm calling in from the traditional land and unceded territories of the Chochenyo Ohlone. I'm a Taiwanese American female with medium complexion, shorter length black hair with brown highlights, black top with white and blue flower embroidery. Next, we'd like to introduce Kelly Aduse. Thanks, Anne. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Aduse, and I am the executive director of Dance USA. I use, I use she, her pronouns, and identify as non disabled. For disability access, I would describe my skin as the color of butterscotch. I have dark brown hair, and it is pulled back in a tight bun at the nape of my neck. Today, I'm wearing a purple top with a large golden owl pendant that you can't really see, but at times I will probably touch it. Um, the lip color I've chosen today is a deep red, although it also seems to look purple today. And on occasion, uh, like today, I am wearing glasses. I am sitting in front of a beige background um, with, uh, you can see part of a lamp, uh, lamp shed in front of, uh, behind me. And on the, uh, over my uh, left shoulder, you can see a painting that is gray. 
I am privileged to be joining this conversation from the unceded ancestral lands of the Cherokee. I would also like to uplift the Anacostian, the Piscataway, and the Pamunkey peoples, whose ancestral and unceded land is where the National uh, Dance USA office is located. And given that Dance USA is a national organization, I am humbled to be a guest living and working on the unceded ancestral lands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Powhatami nations, and many other tribes, including the Kickapoo, whose land I also respectfully call home. I'm really grateful and humbled to be here with you all today and in community with you lovely ladies for this conversation. Thank you so much, Kelly. And I'm gonna go across the camera, Janet. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Janet Rolay. It is spelled R-O-L-L-E with an accent over the E uh, for those who would like to know that. Uh, I am joining you from the unceded lands of the Munse Lenape and Wappinger tribes, but I also like to acknowledge my roots in the territories of the Kalingo and Taino, uh, since my family is from the Caribbean. I use the pronouns she, her, and I joined American Ballet Theater as its CEO and executive director on January 3rd, 2022. Uh, for those who would like to know, I am wearing black as I almost always do. I have on a v-neck dress with a, a black leather insert. My background is blurred. I would describe myself as uh, the color of sunshine on days when it's sunny, uh, but with uh, dark brown freckles. I am a black woman. I have my hair parted in the middle and tied back in a low bun with my curly hair uh, sitting at the nape of my neck uh, in the back. I wear my hair natural uh, almost all of the time, but it is pulled back today uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, I am very grateful to be with this wonderful group of women uh, who are leading us into the future of the arts. Uh, and I hope that everyone who's in attendance uh, feels gratified by the time that they will have spent with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. And we have Sydney. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Sydney Liggett-Dennis. I am the Executive Director of AIM by Kyle Abraham. We are a touring dance company based in New York and artistically led by choreographer Kyle Abraham. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm currently on the land of the Lenape, Lenape and Canarsie in Brooklyn. I am a non-disabled black woman with long brown locks kind of styled half up, half down today. I'm wearing a black and white short sleeve shirt. I have on gold earrings if they're not hidden by my hair. And my background is a blurred white wall. Happy to be here today. Thank you so much, Sydney and Tiffany. Thank you. I'm so excited even just from the introductions. Like I can't, I can't wait. Um, so hello everyone. My name is Tiffany Ray Fisher. My pronouns are she, her. I am a black female with sister locks that hit about my shoulders. Um, my hair is black. I have pink glasses on and a maroon top. I thought today that I would be calling in from the unceded lands of the Lenape. However, I'm calling in from um, what's now called Lake Placid, which sits on Mohawk land. And my background is blurred because I run a school up in the North Country and it was recital season. And I would like you all to think better of me. So my background is blurred. <laughs> so that is, that's what's happening with me. I'm thrilled to be here and um, can't wait to get started. Thank you. 
Wow, thank you so much. I, I am so, so, so humbled to be in your, in your presence. Before we dive into the conversation, um, we'll read a little bit something to, to kind of give context to our conversation today. Um, today's session is preparing for BIPOC executive directors, evolution through revolution. In the last few years, we've seen a tidal wave of BIPOC executive director hires and a historic number of first time BIPOC EDs now leading historically white led institutions, including some of the speakers today, myself included. Whether these BIPOC EDs step into historically white led institutions or not, structural challenges remain in many nonprofits that prevent the EDs and the organizations from thriving fully. Today, our session aims to foster an authentic dialogue and gain insight into the experience of BIPOC EDs, the universal experiences, as well as the individual unique experiences. We also wanna shed the light on the organizational conditions that help BIPOC EDs thrive in recruitment, in hiring, onboarding, and after you start your job. So folks today can lead the session with some concrete roadmaps to implement in their organizations. Everyone listening, we call for everyone to invest in BIPOC features and commit to equity-driven structural shift. It is time for BIPOC evolution through revolution. Let the conversation begin. I wanna frame the conversation with openness, authenticity, boldness, and love. If you're in the audience, feel free to enter your questions in the chat. We will try our best to answer your questions. All right. Um, first question is simply, how did you become the ED of your current organization? Does anybody feel inspired to jump in? I'm happy to start uh, as probably the person that was the most recently appointed uh, to their role. Uh, I was actually happily employed at Parkwood Entertainment, which is the media and management company founded by global icon Beyonce, when I got a call from a search firm. I will say that I have almost never throughout my 30 plus year business career ever secured a position via a search firm. Uh, it's almost exclusive, exclusively been either via my network or personal contact or, or some other route. So I have to say I have a somewhat healthy skepticism of the outcome of a process that starts with a recruiting firm. However, in this instance, uh, the recruiter is someone that I'd worked with on another opportunity that didn't materialize in the past. So I felt very uh, comfortable asking the question when the call came, would they actually hire me? Uh, and the reason I asked that question is because uh, I, I think that the workplace uh, dynamic today centers a lot on wanting to have people who look like me as a candidate, but not necessarily as the person who ultimately lands the position. And so rather than waste anyone's time, I ask the very simple question, would they actually hire me? because if they would, I'd love to have the conversation, but if they would not, there's no point. Uh, and so that's how I actually came into the process for my role is through that search firm. Uh, the board of directors at ABT had a search committee, which of course included lots of the members of the leadership of the organization. But I tell that story to say that I hope and would like to think we've moved past the point of being happy to be a candidate and rather owning the fact that there is no position that should be out of our reach. And I'll leave it at that. Amen, Janet. <laughs> 
Wow. Okay. I'm I'm feeling a jolt of energy right here. Okay. Uh, who would like to go next? <laughs> I'll jump in because I was going to say, is it Sunday? Because are we at church? <laughs> um, so thank you, Anne, for saying um, for saying Amen. Um, this is Kelly. Everyone, I my story is very different than than Janet's. Um, I before transitioning into my role as executive director at Dance USA, and this, I guess, marks about 15 months in this role, um, I had worked at the organization for about 12, 13 years prior. I joined Dance USA uh, first as our office manager and board liaison and was quickly promoted to our director of member services and holding the board work um, for about 10 additional years and then transitioned that to uh, that work to uh, another team member. Um, it's kind of simple. I mean, my, my predecessor found themselves in a place where they were ready for a new chapter in their life. And so this role opened up. Um, what's interesting for me in terms of how I even a- applied for this role is when the job description came out. Um, I had not really, prior to the job description being released, I hadn't really thought of myself in this role or thought like, oh, that's what I wanna do. Um, And when I saw the job description and I read it and I digested it, it, it honestly felt like it was speaking to me. Um, So I applied. And um, went through the, the, the rigorous process, um, interview process for the role, um, and was ultimately um, given, given the opportunity to, to serve uh, our national dance community as executive director of Dance USA. So, um, yes, Janet, to your point on the search firm, uh, that is sort of my pathway, but, but new from the inside. Uh, a lot about Dance USA. And so it was a, I wouldn't say an easier transition, but definitely a more natural um, progression than coming from the outside. Thank you so much, Kelly. And speaking with um, different organizations and um, executive directors, I'm always looking for sort of universal stories that people can take away. Um, And, you know, what are circumstances that happen in quite a few different organizations. I love what Janet just said, um, moving beyond happy to be a candidate to there's no position beyond our reach. In Kelly's case, Kelly's case is actually similar to my case in in that um, there's quite a few um, BIPOC folks uh, serving in senior leadership and they're the program director, development director, such as my case and kind of overlooked because people peg you as like second to command, third in command. And um, it is, I invite organizations to really look at, you know, faces that may not look like their historical ED faces and really, really honor the talents and the historical knowledge. All right. Um, Tiffany, Sydney, do you feel inspired to anyone want to go next? Yeah, Uh, this is Tiffany. I'll I'll, I'll go next um, if that's okay to... I was also an internal hire. So I was a dancer with the company for many years. And before this, we had done a pre-conversation. We had talked about the different types of like EDs. And I remember there being like an inevitable, an accidental. What was the third? Was there a third one, Anne? Yes. Um, the, sorry, the camera's up. Um, all right. So yes, the, in the BIPOC ED hires, what, what I observe is these uh, hires tend to fall into three categories. One, intentional. Two, inevitable. Three, accidental. And um, those three circumstances, um, the, 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 the BIPOC ED hires have three kind of distinct experiences that require um, different organizational structural shift in order to help those EDs thrive in those three kinds of circumstances. Tiffany, yes. Thank you for providing that context. I was thinking about my story and because I am an executive artistic, 
I am, I think, an intentional, inevitable artistic director because I was handpicked by the founder, but I'm an accidental executive director. And that came about um, when I when I took over as artistic director, I was really looking for a culture shift in the organization. And I knew that just me being me, the art would change. So I had said that like our organization, once I had the, the title of executive artistic became very black, very quick, right? Because both sides were me. And I, it's important to me that I lead with all that I am and not allow people to kind of cherry pick parts of me that fits what you're trying to put out into the world. And so um, it took me a long time to really embrace the role as executive director, but I was speaking to friends who were presenters and we did our name change and all of these things. And they're like, the things that are getting people's attention, that's you. The things that are making people draw like that's you, you should get that credit as well. Because lots of times when people think of an artistic director, they think of just the choreography and they're like, you should grab all of the things that you're actually working towards. And so we did have an executive director when um, I came in who I, I brought in, we had worked together before in the organization. Um, and so he was executive director and I was kind of like co-executive director. We did everything together. Once he left, I really wanted to find someone. I feel like that ED, AD relationship is like a marriage. I really wanted to find someone who I could work with and I didn't want to rush it. And it was pointed out there like, you don't need to rush it because all the things that are happening, you, you've either created or have been part of in a real way. So let's try it out. And so right now I hold both of those titles, but artistic was one that, that felt um, more natural to me. And it, had, it took my friends and thank goodness, I really appreciate them saying like, no, no, you are doing this job. You just don't have the title, but you're doing the work. So you might as well grab the title um, and ask for a raise. And I was like, what, can I do that? And it, they were like, yeah, and you should. And then I did and I got it. So it was like, it was really amazing, but it was, it was the field pushing me to get all of, all of my dues, which was really, really helpful. And that's, yeah. Yeah, Tiffany, and this is this sort of executive artist director, artistic executive director has its, its own sort of unique and very complex challenges. Perhaps we can return another time to dance NYC, just have a session on that, because I see, I do see a fair number of people undergoing that as well. It's very difficult to have that as a, as a part of a larger conversation, and that really deserves its own attention. Um, all right, Sydney. Yeah, this is this is great. <laughs> I'm loving this and really enjoying just hearing, you know, all of your trajectories. Um, I guess I'll start with that my background and my degree is in dance, but I've always been really intrigued by the behind the scenes work um, and kind of knew very early on in my career trajectory, like, I mean, I'm talking like 10 years old, <laughs> that I was gonna focus really on arts administration. Um, fast forward, when the opportunity for um, AIM's new ED came about, it was the first full-time executive director that the organization was looking for. Um, I, I wasn't really looking for anything. I wasn't planning on transitioning. I had just actually completed producing and programming um, two back-to-back -back dance USA conferences um, in my position um, as director of uh, programs um, at Dance USA. And I, what I'm told is what happened is that my name came up um, kind of during the recruitment process. Someone suggested that they talk with me. Um, and, and that happened. And, you know, once I learned more about the position, I said, well, maybe, maybe I'll try, you know, maybe I'll just throw my, my hat in the ring. Um, I didn't really think I'd make it that far. I, I didn't think I was ready. And I guess when I kind of reflect on that now, I believe I felt that I didn't fit the, the profile of what we've kind of traditionally seen um, in leadership, whether that's age or race or experience or even gender. Um, but nonetheless, I decided to, to go through with it and just, you know, try and, and learn more about the organization in the process. And 
I remember actually after my first conversation um, with some members of the board, I thought, uh oh, <laughs> I think I, I think I did pretty well. I think they like me, and I'm really liking where this is going as well. And so, a few you know interviews and conversations later, I was ultimately offered the role. Um, and um, you know, kind of similarly to, to you, Kelly, I, I don't know. I just felt like this was where I was meant to be. I was being led in this direction. It was it was almost actually a little spiritual in a sense. Um, but I started at the end of 2019, right before the start of the pandemic which of course presented its own challenges, but um, you know, otherwise I'm really glad to, to be in this role and I'm really grateful that someone saw something in me and saw the readiness that I didn't see in myself. That's wonderful. Um, it's so great to hear from you all that um, you came to your role um, being sort of really uh, authentically led by your heart because it seems like you know, uh, none of us were like looking for this position <laughs> and the path of this position was something we never experienced before. And then here we are, we feel kind of drawn to it. Um, I love what you just said, Sydney, almost like a spiritual experience. And so we know we're meant to be here. So the question remains, okay, that's internal. The question remains is externally, even though we, you know, uh, we're told you're the perfect person for the job externally were conditions set up for us to kind of thrive in this uh, role and therefore um, for the organization to thrive. You know, when the ED does not thrive, the organization does not thrive clearly, right? So that leads to my second question. Um, let's talk a little bit about before you started working at your position, we were all hired in our current position the last few years. During, um, during the uh, recruitment, hiring, onboarding process, um, what were the conditions? Well, could you state anything that you observed during those periods that were that were that were really great for you? So the uh, recruitment, hiring, onboarding would be, you know, the 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 the, the po at the point that you were contacted or application process, interview process. You're meeting with the board. If you there was an executive search firm, how was it? What worked? What did not work? Any message you want to give to the attendees who are contemplating their BIPOC ED hire, where it's first or not? Any any guidance you have for them? Because a lot of organizations are contemplating this question. This is Kelly. I'll I'll jump in. Um, and. Maybe my response or what's coming up for me is sort of answering your question, Anne, or maybe, you know, answering it adjacent. But I would say that one piece that did not actually work well or, or if organizations are considering a new hire just in general, but in particular, uh, a, a BIPOC. Uh, executive and or uh, team member is really thinking carefully about the timeline. So what I mean by that is the hire itself is not the endpoint of the process um, because there needs to be continual support, onboarding, um, acclimation for that individual as they're moving into your organization. And I think that that's, that, was une that was an uneven experience for me. And I realized that it, it, if my hire was not considered the end point, perhaps some aspects of the acclimation could have been um, perhaps easier. This is Janet. I'd love to pick up on this point um, for two reasons. One, I had a 30 year career in the media business before I came to this role. And what I learned sometimes very painfully is the way you go into an organization is the way you go out. So if you come in underpaid, you're going to leave underpaid. If you come in undertitled, you're likely to leave undertitled. And so in my situation, I felt it was very important 
for me personally as a professional, but also as a signal to others that I got the CEO title in addition to executive director. I felt it was important that there was acknowledgement of the 30 years I had spent building my business career so that I didn't come in and just assume the title of my predecessor, who with all respect, did not have that experience. And I think that it is critical, especially for us, to negotiate for ourselves and advocate for ourselves as much as possible when the glow is all over, the fact that you're going to be sitting in the seat rather than come in in a way that seems like you're just grateful and then you find that over time, people expect you to continue to be grateful, whether they're resourcing you correctly or not, whether they're advocating for you in the way that they should or not, whether they're willing to put their reputations on the line for your success. So what I would say is that the celebration of achieving the higher is is the very, very beginning of a very long journey. And the way that you go in, I think, is going to establish and determine whether or not you get the support and resources you need along that journey. Double amen, uh, Janet. Uh, <laughs> wow, I, I see another day of NYC uh, session in the future. Like, uh, how to negotiate <laughs> what you need when you come in as as ed or anybody you know so okay um wow all right i'm i'm just sitting that i took a lot of notes i have so many follow up questions and um regarding that question of the her a b you know the hiring onboarding recruiting that phase does anybody want to talk about what worked in your opinion, and what did not work? Yeah, I can jump in. This is Sydney. Um, I mean, I think what worked for me is I had a lot of really valuable touch points, um, not just with the board, but with the staff. And I think we don't always see that. Um, for some reason, the staff some gets ignored. Um, but I had, you know, some really great conversations, you know, one-on-ones and two-on-ones and, you know, just really being able to, um, understand sort of, you know, what questions they might have for me, what questions I have from them from a staff green perspective. Um, and also, you know, that opportunity to set those expectations, um, and, and seeing if the staff is also willing and open to the changes that I might bring forth. So that was really valuable for me. And I really appreciated that. Um, I was provided that time. Um, I didn't have to ask for it. It was actually just coordinated, um, which through that process drew me even further into the organization that they were considering their team and their staff. Um, and then just overall, I felt really, um, I felt that the board, even at the, that during the recruitment and interview process, that they were behind me. Um, and so to have that support, you know, I, I felt like they wanted to see me win and they were rooting for me. And that was needed. That was helpful. That that helped with my confidence and helped me push forward through this process that I knew I was taking on and getting ready to undertake um, a pivotal position. Yeah, that really, really is the key. You know, the board that hires you wants you to succeed, even if they don't fully have the concrete roadmap to help you succeed. But at least, you know, that partnership conversation between the executive director and the board, like, what can we do? You know, and, and also what helps you the most in year one, maybe different than year two, year three. Um, and so uh, as the as Kelly's board chair, <laughs> Yes, yes, we meet every other week and we talk about that a lot, right? You know, Kelly's coming to her second year and we 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 talk quite a bit about what what do you need right now? Uh, I am as a board chair, I am your advocate uh, in front of the board. Um, so great. Thank you so much, Sydney. Um, Tiffany, I know you wanted to address a uh, a question from the audience, but if you want to, you know, kind of answer that general question about the, you know, your experience in the recruitment, hiring, um, uh, onboarding process, feel free to do so as well. Tiffany? 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I will do both. Because I was an inside hire, I think I have always had like an operations mind. I like to know how things work. I like to work to like best and better practices. I like to look to other um, genres, institutions, like how, what are they doing? How can we bring that in? Uh, so all ships rise. And so as a dancer, I also, I started off just volunteering in the office. And I used to really love to write. I used to write a lot. Um, and there was an opportunity that came up and I, I asked if I could write a grant. And I was like, I've never written a grant before, but I really love writing. Um, if I write a grant, if, if I'm able to, I can write the salary for my admin work into it. If we get it, keep it moving. If we don't, don't worry about it. I am interested in how this works, uh, what is needed to support a successful dance company. So that, um, I think just the board and people seeing that that was a genuine interest led to a lot of trust and that I really understood the operation. I un understood front of house, backstage, on stage, all of those things. So I think the board really trusted and knew that I was going to be coming from a holistic place. And I, I feel one of the reasons that I'm able to hold both titles right now is because they're not in conflict. You need both to support the other and it should be one idea of like how, how we're moving forward as a unit. And so I think that was really helpful to be seen that way. It's like, oh no, it's not like we're gonna have to like, okay, she really knows how to, you know, set the rep, but we're gonna have to really get her understanding like the budgets and the granting. And it's like, no, 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 I've been doing that. And I think just because I started, it was just genuine interest. I wanted to shadow someone to just understand. And then as opportunities presented themselves, I took advantage of this opportunity and this opportunity and ultimately made a, a position for myself. So I was the company's first director of education through that grant because we got it and was able to expand and create an educational program. And then it just, from that point, then I think people were like, oh, okay. So that, um, that's how, how my process was on, on that end. Speaking to Jamal, and hi, Jamal, I'm glad that you're here. Um, the question is, as an AD, um, how did you introduce yourself to the board of directors and or already established dance communities? So because I was an internal hire, I was very familiar with the board, but I didn't take that for granted. I did one-on-ones with them. And my question, I just had one question for them was what, well, was, I guess it was a two-part. It was like, what made you join the board and what makes you stay on the board? I was just curious um, because I inherited a board. And so I was just curious of like, what are the things? Because I want to make sure that even if I decide not to highlight those things, that I'm aware of them. And surprisingly, a lot of our board members were coming because of the enhanced education programs that we were doing. And I, would have, I was shocked by that. That was not something that I would have really known. So I, I, even though I had at that point had had a 12 year relationship with the board members as a dancer, um, I just didn't take that for granted. And I had the sit down, I let them tell me what they wanted to tell me as, a, as an ED, as an AD, like I switched gears with them. And then to the established dance community, what I can say is that my colleagues in the field, and I've made sure to also be part of the field. I think that was the other thing. I, I really did not want to work in a silo. Like I wanted to be part of the field. I made sure to join boards, to show up on things, to support other artists. And so all to say, I kind of had a network of storytellers that could help me say, Tiffany's here, this is exciting. This is why you should be excited. And so Dance USA, Dance NYC, IBD, other dance companies, they rallied and they were like, this is happening. And so that helped as a reintroduction as well versus me having to be my storyteller to tell you how great I think this is gonna be. Like, that's really rough. That's really hard to do. Um, and I don't, maybe I just don't have a personality for it, but it's, it's, it's challenging. So I, for me, I think the biggest kind of, um, 
what really landed specifically, I'm gonna shout these two people out is Virginia Johnson from Dance Theater of Harlem. She would introduce me as this is my, this is my colleague, Tiffany. And this is someone who I had looked up to forever. And it also cemented in my mind, like you have to level up because this is where you are now. Like ready or not, you are here. So take up all of that space, be in this place in a real way. Um, and then also Juan Jose Escalante, who was the ED of Limon, who's now at NDT. And I think because one is an AD, one is an ED, and they treated me, there was no infantilization. There was no, oh, you're brand new. It was like, let's roll out. Here we go. And that was really helpful. And it was a mind shift for, for me as well that not only do I have to take up space in the space that I need to in my organization, that has to go to the field as well. And you have to hold that space wherever you go. And that was really helpful. But it having the community actually rally and that network of storytellers was crucial. Yes. Um, so, you know, I want to give a shout out to these, these network organizations that are so important in supporting us, WOCA, IABD, Kaisha, I know you're here. <laughs> so let's say hi to you. <laughs> um, and I'll, and um, there, there's one thing that came up. And again, as we continue the conversation for all the speakers, feel free to ask each other questions. Um, you know, if anything kind of comes up for you, this is a roundtable dialogue. Um, so I think Tiffany Kelly, your internal hires, you, you, have, you came into the ED position with a lot of institutional knowledge. Janet, Sydney, uh, you are not internal hires, although Sydney, I, I don't believe you were brand, brand, brand new to Kyle Abraham. Um, so for, the, for those folks who are not internal hires, you know, so much of that like first year of ED is just gaining that institutional knowledge. Um, I'm wondering, you know, for organizations contemplating their ED hire, do you have any suggestions for organizations to really help you um, gain that institutional knowledge to help, you know, that, that would, that is part of the thriving of the first year, right? Like where's everything, who's everything and, and building trusting relationships. Um, you know, this, this question specifically for Janet and Sydney, but, you know, Tiffany and Kelly, if you want to jump in as well, sort of that gaining the institutional knowledge, which is such an important part in being a thriving ED. Sure. I mean, I, this is Janet. I, I think that if you have sound leadership and management skills, um, that you can scale the learning curve more quickly, generally speaking, which is to say that if you're a person who's a good listener, if you're a person who's not afraid to ask questions, and if you are a person that believes that there is value and valuable information throughout an organization and not just at the senior leadership level, uh, I think that it, it's not that difficult to learn. I think it's also, if you, if you have a learner's mindset, you're going to do things to help prepare yourself that the organization won't necessarily do for you, like read books or, or other, uh, other things. Um, so that's one at coming in as an outsider. But what I would also say is uh, <laughs> another aspect of my experience, especially because in my media career, almost every single one of my jobs was a newly created position. Uh, that my specific mindset going in is the institutional knowledge is valuable, but it should not be a constraint uh, because nine times out of 10, I've been brought into organizations to either turn them around or establish a function that didn't exist prior. And so the institutional knowledge for me is a base from which to leap it is not um, a tether that I feel responsible to maintain. Uh, my least favorite expression is, well, this is how we've always done it. If this is how you've always done it, then you wouldn't need me, right? Or you wouldn't need new thinking or you wouldn't need um, 
revitalization or rebranding or repositioning. And so uh, I think that the way that I tend to look at these things uh, is from a brand lens, that there is a history and a legacy for almost every place that I've worked from HBO to CNN to BET to MTV networks, but that ultimately my job is to redefine that legacy for today and the future. So the institutional knowledge is the base, but what comes on top of that is in my mind going to be the difference between success and failure. I just wrote that down, Janet, a base from which to leap. <laughs> that was really great and really I helpful. That down too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm on a Zoom call. You're going to see like, what the Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because I, it, it's so true. I mean, you know, I think in terms of my experience and really trying to figure out, you know, gaining the institutional knowledge, um, it's definitely a balance of what was provided for me and then what I had to acquire on my own. Um, I entered with, um, towards the end of a strategic plan process. So that was really great. It allowed me to really understand the direction, the key focus areas um, and become acquainted with the company in a more nuanced way. Um, there was also a really helpful document that we just called the 306090, which provided clear guidelines and expectations on where my attention might need to be um, for 30, 60 and 90 days. Um, but then after that, it, it's on me, right? To really form and develop the next steps. Um, another thing that was really great um, was um, a coach that was provided to me um, without me asking. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it was a previous um, ED who was, you know, a resource and consultant to me. Um, and particularly as a first time ED, um, you know, that was really great to have because I was still kind of really trying to understand what it means, not only to be at this level of uh, leadership, but also what really is the role of an executive director. Um, the, the challenge there is that the coach um, who I am adore and is just so grateful for, uh, we didn't have the same lived experiences. Um, and so I wasn't always comfortable bringing everything their way. And so, you know, I had to personally sought, you know, seek some support of, um, you know, Black women EDs for additional guidance and, you know, that some people I can engage with um, from a more cultural perspective. Um, so, you know, it really is that balance of, you know, being really grateful to what the organization was able to provide for me, but also, you know, being proactive about how I needed the resources that I needed to best lead the organization. And this is Kelly, I want to jump in based on what you just said, Sydney, and um, Tiffany's amplification of, um, of Juan Escalante and Virginia Johnson, this notion of mentors or creating your own personal network or support system. Um, I think in one of our prep calls, I called it like the underground railroad for, for BIPOC EDs, where we do need to come together and have the conversations is how we, how we are leading, but through our cultural lens. Um, and that is, I think, a vital aspect to, um, to how we show up, right? Because it isn't just about us showing up as the leader. It's also about us as the human in the role. And what are, what is that balance of, um, what is that balance in order to be fully present as the leader day to day, but then also not leave fully depleted as you like shift back into, um, you know, your, your personal life. So I just want to really like name the tangible resources, like the 30, 60, 90 day plan, like a strategic plan. I mean, I'm grateful um, for Dancer to say that we had a strategic plan from which I could move from, um, but sort of the intangible things that come up, like building your own internal network support system, because it's just, it's so vital. Yeah, I'd love to pick up on that um, very briefly. Uh, this is Janet. I tell a story often about my career and how when I made the transition from MTV Networks to AOL, I had never worked in digital media. And I tell people this story all the time because I always like to name and acknowledge who my mentor was at AOL 
and it was a black man who was in human resources who was junior to me. And I think people really mistake what this notion of mentorship is in that they always see it as some hierarchical relationship between you and someone who's more senior. And in my mind, your mentor is the person who can give you the best information to help you succeed. And in the case at AOL, it was this person who was not in the content area, who was not sort of in the the guts of the business, so to speak, but because he was a black man in that environment, because he worked in the people operation, he really understood what made that organization tick. And he was my mentor at AOL. It wasn't my boss. It wasn't anybody who would be the obvious choice. It was the person who had the best information and the most desire and willingness to support my success. Yeah, and um, kind of in alignment to Sydney's point of folks who either have similar lived experiences compared to you or can really understand your lived experiences. Um, Kelly had touched upon the, the network and um, there's a, a great interest uh, within the women of color um, uh, are, uh, in the arts network in starting a national, I, I, I believe it will be their, their first national affinity group for executive directors. Um, I'm uh, having lots of conversation with Kaisha uh, about that. Hopefully we will launch that. Um, for anybody watching this session, if, if you're a funder that would like to support that above ground railroad <laughs> network, <laughs> uh, please, please contact us. Okay. Um, all right. Now, in, in our conversation, uh, concrete things that you mentioned uh, for the organization, uh, such as you know coaching and and an existing strategic plan equi equity based strategic plan um you know came up as far as oh these concrete things were there when I was hired and onboarded or after after I started working these were really really helpful um so that we give um you know some concrete um ideas to those folks who were in the audience um, when you were hired, and I guess after you started working, if you want to name the top like three to five things for the organization to have in, in place, let's say, you know, I work for XYZ organization, we're contemplating the next executive director, we want to hire by pop ED, okay, and, but it's not immediate, we may want to do it in a year. What are the things uh, our organization need to absolutely have? Do we need to make sure we set aside a pot of money for, for coaching? You know, um, do we, um, if, if we are something Kelly and I talk about is for first time, first time BIPOC EDs and in, in um, historically white led institutions, how much racial equity work has the organization done? Not just the DEI phase, right? Um, and, uh, when the, when the organization, both board and staff, especially on the board, if they're barely along or have not done any anti-racism work, um, there's a, um, oftentimes there's a lot of harm that the ED experiences. Um, and this was my case. It was, it was very, very, very dramatic and very traumatic for quite some time. So um, yeah, sort of popcorn, any, any thoughts regarding, uh, you know, for the BIPOC ED, you know, during, if you're contemplating hiring BIPOC ED, what are the things you wanna make sure you have in place? This is Janet. I, I actually think the thing that I've needed the most in the not quite three months <laughs> that I've been in my role is actually the ability to question and not have my questions be taken as anything other than questions. Uh, and the extension of faith that I'm 
I'm capable and able to process the answers in a way that will benefit the institution uh, is something that I think is absolutely essential. And it sounds perhaps a little esoteric, but there's a, there's a direct application uh, for me, even in this initial three months. Uh, so we, we talked a little bit about being able to inherit a strategic plan. Well, I also had the need to question elements of that plan uh, and not just presume that because it's handed to me that it is actually the right plan uh, for the organization. And, and, and for there to be enough what I describe as egoless leadership in the organization to not take my questions personally, but to understand that that's one how I learn and, and sharpen and shape my own thinking, but that ultimately I might actually have a different path for the organization that is an improvement over the path that I was handed. Uh, and, and I think it's important that we are extended that grace uh, and not just presumed to be the caretaker of a thing. That we actually have the ability to bring that thing to a place it's never been. Uh, and that that should be encouraged and supported and believed in. I think this is Tiffany here. I think what's important for organizations to understand is that you're bringing in an individual. And so people are very quick to check a box and be like, oh, well, they said we should do these three things. We did these, these three things and we're done. What Janet would need coming from Beyonce and HBO and AOL is different than what I need coming off stage. And so I think acknowledging that one, the role was set up for a particular person, typically a white male. So anyone that is not that coming in is going to need something. And I would also say to examine pushback. If I ask for, and you keep questioning me, I'm a five foot one black woman. Go ahead and imagine me as a six foot tall white male and go at that pace, like at a clip. You know, like that's that's the thing. And I feel like it's it's important to ache acknowledge that if I'm telling you, you hired me, you, there's some amount of trust that we have going on. And if I say I need, we need, the, it's, we're not, it's not really a conversation. It's a, I'm, I'm stating what needs to happen for me to be successful so that we can be successful. And I think lots of times the lens in which there's so many lenses and filters that we have to take off of like, who is deserving of my time, my energy, my trust, my that. So we need to dig a little deeper. And if you find yourself as an organization, every time your ED asks for whatever, instead of saying, let's try to find it, that it's coming back with some type of pushback, take a moment, pause on that, double click on that because there, there's something, there's something there. So, you, you know, like that, that is my takeaway. It's a, it's, there's some internal things and that can't be done by taking a, um, an EDI session. It can't be like, it has to be real examination of how am I treating this person? Am I treating this person this way? Because there are filters, there are lenses that societally and historically say they are not deserving of my fill in the blank. If that is true, that's your starting point. Back it up from there. So that is like my roundabout way. It's not like a, but it's it's that if you find yourself doing this, please, you know, back into it so that, because I think there still is a way through. There's still a way through, but you have to acknowledge that behavior as a problematic behavior and then move from that point. Thank you, Tiffany. I um, want to kind of reflect back a little bit. I heard from Sydney and Kelly, uh, both of you received coaching, right? Um, paid by the organization. Uh, while co the idea of providing coaching to the new ED is good, it's very important that the ED gets to um, 
to uh, pick the coach that is the best coach for you. And um, whether it's a skill set or lived experiences or just personality match and so forth. Um, I'm hearing from Janet and um, Kelly, while it's great that an organization does have a strategic plan, it is important for the organization to give, give, give space to that ED to question um, the strategic plan and not be punishing. Hey, we're in year two of strategic plan. How, how come you're not doing X, Y, Z? Which leads to my next point, which I hear from so many of the EDs, which is this sort of like expectation of magical BIPOC woman ED trope. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and fix everything uh, for us because either you are so capable, uh, so competent, or, oh, we hired you. Okay, just, just fix it. You know, I think for all five of us, it arranges quite a bit of that. So if there is one thing I want to say to everybody listening is, yeah, we are, we are, we are humans. And yes, we are um, competent and a badass, if I may say, you know, in, the, in a public forum. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, we are, um, you know, an organization's success is collaboration, not just this one person, right? Um, does anybody have any comment about, for some of us who are coming in to historically wide-led institutions or not? Um, does anybody want to comment on sort of the organization's necessary racial equity work, anti-racism work, DEI work for the BIPOC ED to thrive? I, I think all of us had a variety of experiences, yeah. This is Sydney, um, and I kind of just wanted to circle back to your point um, and about the, the strong Black woman trope, <laughs> um, because it's very real. And I've also had to take some time, though, to step back and figure out how I've internalized it myself as well. Um, you know, I think I realized maybe a year or so into my tenure that I was just holding on way too much and wasn't delegating efficiently. Um, yeah, it was just <laughs> there was just a lot to carry. Um, and while I was doing a good job of, you know, holding it all together, both for myself and for the organization, um, it was really kind of weighing on me internally. And so I think it's really important for boards and for organizations to recognize this, to check in and make sure that, you know, your BIPOC leader isn't drowning with the expectation that they're supposed to do it all, fix it all, um, and be, you know, this magical being that <laughs> comes in and just totally revamps the organization. Um, that can happen, but it takes time, it takes collaboration. But I think also I challenge all of us, <laughs> myself maybe, <laughs> um, as BIPOC leaders to really grapple with how we're internalizing these expectations um, of ourselves and you know, learning how and when to ask for that, that help that's needed. That's, that's a great point. This is Janet speaking, Sydney. Uh, I have a it's not the most positive definition uh, you've ever heard of diversity, but it's mine. And what I say to people all the time is that we will have achieved true diversity and equity if I have the equal opportunity to fail and not have that failure be fatal. Uh, for myself and for people who look like me. This idea that you are the sole representative of the entirety of your gender, gender, your race, your gender and race simultaneously, and that somehow what you do is a reflection on everyone else, um, especially when in times of challenge, if there's one thing I could fix, it would be that. And, and I think that's part of the reason that I'm so adamant about this definition is because we are so often, to Sydney's point, charged with bearing the burden of being the representation of everyone who looks like us rather than uh, to, to Tiffany's earlier point. No, I'm Janet. 
I am also a black woman, but at the end of the day, I am just me. Uh, and while I, it's always my endeavor to represent myself, my family, my heritage, my race, my gender, as credibly and creditably as I possibly can, I'm also imperfect. And, and I, I really think that, um, again, this idea that we, we always have to be successful at every turn or else we're somehow invalidated uh, is, is the thing that I wish I could fix the fastest. Yeah, well, I, I think um, by bringing in up, the, I think, Jenna, your sentiment, I, I think I can say, you know, all of us echoed that, like very, very, very strongly. Um, this really came up in our prep call as well. Um, Tiffany, I know you wanted to go next. Address Thank you. Question. Yeah, I wanted to speak to the question of how you see revolution, revolution, uh, revolution happening through dance. And uh, this is something that I think about a lot. And so I'll just make I statements on what I'm doing. I really feel like education is key. And I think how you treat people is key. So my personal like journey, um, joy is part of my daily practice and it's part of my artistic process. It's also, I use joy as protest and I use joy as a political statement because I am politicized, just I am. And so one of the things for me is I have, and it is throughout my company culture in my company, in the school of a, of a do no harm. And so it is my hope that in, in trying my best and making it clear that I'm trying not to do harm to my dancers, to my students, that they in turn, we have a, a generation of dance, dancers that are less, less harmed by the craft, right? Because, and, and hopefully they will then do less harm. There's a, a lot of harm that is done. And I think that there's, I think we talk a lot about how the arts can heal, how the arts can, but I, I really have started using my company and my way of interacting with my company as a case study for exactly that. And what that ripple effect is when people are cared for, listened to, and set, and, and actively, um, again, moving forward with an active do no harm. Not like, I hope that I don't, you know, not, not just a quick to apologize, but an active do no harm. And what does that do? And so that is the personal revolution that I am working on and constantly inspired by. And while doing that, making sure that that work doesn't weigh me down. I love my job. I love my dancers and my joys, my success because this system, this country was not meant for people like me to be joyful for sure, and definitely not to succeed. Both of those things is the wham pow, that I'm gonna do that on a daily basis um, and, and not have it be a burden while hopefully also having this ripple effect of allowing other people to feel joy because it's, it's allowing for a vulnerability and a humanity to enter into spaces that sometimes we don't have the luxury of holding or being or acknowledging that. And I think that speaks back to that, either super hear this or like whatever type of trope or stereotype that is that is attached to us. I think just being able to, to feel joy, to be silly, to be able to be vulnerable is crucial and I think we actually can get real resu results and revolution through that. I love what you just said, uh, Tiffany, joy as protests and the individual um, revolution. The, the word revolution is, in, is in, within the title of our session and really collective revolution begins with individual revolution inside. I cannot believe we only have 15 minutes left. Um, so I'm going to ask two more questions. Can I, Anne, can I actually just oh, jump in and please. just around the revolution piece? Um, Tiffany, you're inspiring me to, to make this offering, but I think that we also need to understand that being revolutionary is 
is and can be as simple as saying no, no, thank you, and rejecting what is or what was. And in the spirit of centering those that we want to center in order to create something new. So I think that um, revolutionary moments can happen all the time and in, and in big and also small, small ways. And no is a full sentence. Wow, Kelly, I'm taking so many notes. I see in our next check-in, this, uh, you know, CNN has like the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, like run, <laughs> write all these things, or is it going to like, you know, run that through our, our, our next chicken? Um, wow. Um, so as we move forward to, to, to wrapping up the session, um, what, uh, What does uh, in currently and moving forward in the near future, what is the one thing you would like to see in your organization to help you thrive? I need this, I'd like to see this or nothing. This is Sydney. Um, I don't know. I guess the way I kind of interpret that question is like, what do I need to bring my full self and show up fully? You know, what do I need to bring my creativity, my anxieties, my questions, my power, and to do so really unapologetically? And it really is what we've been talking about. It's really just that mindset and willingness to be ready and open for change. Um, and, and just thinking about the future being willing and open for my individual growth and knowing that my, um, my ideas, my innovation that I have today is always evolving. And so working on the trust and the relationship building with my team, with Kyle, with the dancers, with the staff, with the board, with everyone, um, you know, is really important to, you know, always be kind of recalibrating that trust and being open to the, the different phases of, um, of our growth and our development. Um, particularly for me, I think as a, you know, early mid career ED, I, I hope that there is space for growth and a willingness for that growth and change. That, that particular space for continual growth. Yeah. 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 Anyone else want to chime in? This is Janet. Uh, I think the two things that I think about, and, and again, this is probably related to how early in my tenure I am. The first is that appointing me is not the end. Um, and at some point, the celebration of my appointment has to stop and the active support of my appointment has to start. Uh, so that's one thing that I think about um, in my own particular case. The other thing I think a lot about, because I approach my role very much like a business person, is that there has to be patience with the way that I feel things need to change in order to create the future we say we want. And so what that means to me is not just the visual representation of change, but the procedural representation of change, as an example. When we are looking to hire someone, we have to stop making appointments and start having processes, right? This is a, 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 an insular world in some ways, very similar to the media business in that regard where someone feels they can pick up the phone and call a friend and fill a position. No, we're going to have to stop making those calls and we're going to start having an open hiring process where people can come forward who might be interested in either that vendor contract 
or that full-time position or, or any other number of things. And so I think for me, there's a personal side of it, which is, okay, we can stop celebrating now and move on to the support I need to be successful. But I also need the patience with the way some of this change has to take place. Um, and, and for people not to think that because I've arrived, the entire complexion of the full organization has also changed. That will, that will take time, effort, and patience on my part and on the part of others. And I'll, I'll go, um, this is Kelly, because Susan and Janet, you both have said things that have been top of mind for me. Um, and to an earlier question, I think on what, ne- what, is, uh, what is necessary, I was going to say that it's, it's that notion of time. Like we have to think differently about time. Um, yes, there are things that are very urgent and that level of urgency at any given moment has to ebb and flow with, um, in a reality, but also with what we have in, in any given moment. So my offering, um, would be, um, needing to be well resourced in order for change. I think that, and when I talk about resource, I'm talking about like financial resource. So like the dollars, um, which can translate into human resources. Um, I think that when we're talking about affecting or making systemic change, there's, there's like, okay, you're going to do it on a shoestring. And that doesn't, that's not always, um, I think a reality, I think to, to make systemic change, it's, it's work that is, needs to be constant and continuous. You must be patient. And there also must be resources, financial resources in order to make that change happen. And when I think about the changes I envision for Dance USA, for me, it does come back to being well-resourced from the financial standpoint, but also from the human standpoint. Um, So I I just, I think if I'm going to thrive in this organization, we have to shift our organizational structure. Um, And in order to do that, we have to have the capacity to be able to grow um, and grow into that future because yes, parts of it can happen now within our current structure. But I think going back to that notion of time and when urgency um, quicker, if we had, if we, if we were well-resourced financially and with human capital. I agree a hundred percent. I mean, I, when I first took this job, everyone was so worried about thinking about the future because they kept being like, we don't know if we're going to be here tomorrow. And I'm like, well, then why did you hire me? Like, I, like, <laughs> I was like, I feel like. Right. Why the, they put that pressure on you, right? <laughs> you know, so I, I fully agree. And like the place that we're are, we are now is like, what is the per hour pay for our teachers for their prep time, not for their teaching time, but like for their prep time. So it's a whole different conversation. And my, in like what I've been able to do because the organization is better resource resource has allowed us to go on this. Like we've been able to achieve things that were in our 10 year plan in five, we've been able to. And so, um, The other thing, this is the last thing that I will say, whether the organization um, provides it or not, as an individual, if you're a person of color, like run, don't walk to WOCA and IBD, like run, because that's the other thing. Like a lot of the time, the community can fill in some of those gaps for you so that you're not alone. And I think that is the main thing, the true loneliness of like leadership but then on top of that our gender and race is very real and so to just have someone that understands that we don't have to take it from the top we can take it from the middle of the book and everyone's like "Mm -hmm, I understand is is crucial so having those networks out there and like when I started this I was in a broken place 
those organizations, the women of those organizations, like, were like, we got you. <laughs> and, you know, I was able to thrive because of that. And once my organization realized like, oh, wait, you're paying to go to these conferences. You're, they're like, oh, that's so embarrassing. We need to do, we need to step up and do those things and provide that support with you. We need to. So that was really helpful. So there are some things too, that if your org isn't there yet, it's like push it, but also you don't have to suffer by yourself. And the, the fees are very low. And I feel like if your organization cannot support those fees, it maybe it's, you can go somewhere else and you're, you're worth that and, 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 and. Well, I'm mindful at the time. I think um, I want to thank um, all of the speakers for such a rich, generative and super, super powerful and bold conversation. I hope we can um, continue this at, at another place, another time soon. I think in looking at our schedule, I think it's time to bring the NY Dance NYC folks back for conclusion, <laughs> acknowledgements. <laughs> Thank you, Anne, Kelly, Janet, Sydney, and Tiffany for this beautiful conversation. To our attendees, I hope you were able to take away some transformative ideas and considerations. A final thank you to our sponsors, to our accessibility service providers, Nancy Rivera from Viscardi Center, and Emilio Garcia and Alyssa Banner from SciNexus for their invaluable support. We are heading over to the session follow-up chat in the community section to take a few questions and wrap up the conversation. So what's next? The daily debrief is next. Synthesize and reflect on everything you attended at Symposium. You can continue to experience the Symposium by creating virtual meetups and online conversations at our community board, or take some time away from the screen and rest. Tonight's program includes closing remarks from Dance NYC, artistic offerings by the Clark Center and Hunter College Dance Department, and our final keynote conversation entitled, Building Community Around Dance for a Future Society. At an important global tipping point for change, this conversation forecasts what building community around dance will demand of the dance field and the wider society as we know it. Knowledgeable practitioners in technology, education, producing and presenting discuss the world they are preparing for and how they will serve it. We will be joined by Adham Hafez, Chris Walker, Kamal Sinclair, and Christopher McDowell on panel, and moderator Onye Azuzu. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Cheers. Thank you for joining today's session. A special thanks to our funders, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Howard Gilman Foundation, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, New York State Council on the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Arts. A special thanks to our lead corporate sponsor, Con Edison, and our lead dance advocate, Jody Gottfried Arnold. Subsidies for the Education and Dance Worker ticket tiers are made possible by the Arnold Foundation. A special thanks to our leader, host, and partner level sponsors, 92nd Street Y, Harkness Dance Center, Dance Education Library, Cataliodi Law, Full Out Creative, Gibney Dance Center, Kumbe Center for African and Diaspora Dance, The Actors Fund, Ballet Hispanico, Fit for Dance, Nai Ni Chin Dance Company, NDI Collaborative for Teaching and Learning, New York Live Arts, and Tom O'Connor Consulting Group. And last, but certainly not least, a special thanks to our Justice, Equity, and Inclusion Partners, Art Beyond Sight, Art Space Sanctuary, Asian American Arts Alliance, Center for Traditional Music and Dance, the International Association of Blacks in Dance, Lotus Music and Dance, Museum Arts and Culture Access Consortium, 
National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, New York Foundation for the Arts, and Women of Color in the Arts. Up next at 415, we gather in community in our daily debrief. And at six o'clock, we gather for our final keynote presentation. Stay connected with us by posting your takeaways on social media using the hashtags DanceSimp, DanceNYC 2022, and DanceSimp 2022. On Instagram at dance.nyc, on Twitter at dance.nyc, and on Facebook at dance slash NYC. Some features not to miss. Build your agenda of sessions. Connect with other attendees. Join community conversations. Visit the exhibitor hall. Don't forget to check out the 2022 Symposium Digital Program Book. How are we doing? Did you like a session? Use the like feature on your favorite session. Got feedback for us? Take the post-event survey after March 19th and tell us how we did. Need help? Email us at customerservice at dance.nyc. A special thanks to our broadcast streaming partners at Full Out Creative. Thanks for joining. Keep in touch at dance.nyc.